Hello folks, what's the crack? Hugh James here. Welcome back to Mental Health, the podcast where we discuss the latest tools, cutting edge research and ancient practices to help you take back control of your emotional well-being. Today's episode is the second half of our Addiction 101 special where we are doing a deep dive into the causes, the treatments, the neuroscience and even the potential superpowers around this specific disorder. If you haven't checked out last week's episode, Really, really recommend going back and listening to that one first just to set the context for everything we end up talking about today, which is really more focused on the treatment options available for people with addiction. And things we talk about today, they range from like weirdly enough drugs used to treat addiction, 12-step programs like AA, I'm sure a lot of us have heard about, but don't necessarily know what actually happens in these programs or why do they seem to work for a lot of people. We also talk about deep listening, acceptance therapy, willpower management systems, and on and on and on. If you've been listening to this show for a while, you know the drill. It's far-reaching, lots of topics, lots of interesting stones that we unturn as we try to piece together and figure out what actually works here, what are some of the options that we can try, or the people that we love in our life to get us back into that place of freedom and that place of equilibrium. So yeah, look, thanks so much for being here. I'm a big fan of short intros and know you are too. So please sit back and relax or stand up and run or whatever you're going to do this next hour or so. And welcome back to your ears, Hugh and Steve from the past. So this is really interesting. I, I, I accidentally said it earlier on. I said willpower doesn't work. And then it was like, ding, ding, ding. Something in my brain just went off. And I was like, hey, you, that's a book that you've actually read. And it's that very point. It's a guy called Benjamin Hardy. I think he's a behavioral psychologist. Yep. And his big message this this book is like it's worth it just for this like one like little thing that i'm about to say he's like willpower is unbelievably finite you have a teeny tiny puny little amount of it every single day to use in your life so if you're trying to like white knuckle your way through life it's just not going to work he says what smart successful people who know how to hack themselves do is they invest that small amount of willpower into a system that will take care of them. So, you know, the rehab example is a great example. I can just about chalk up the willpower to drive to this facility or to ask a friend or family member to intervene and take me there. And now that I'm in this rehab program, everything somewhat happens automatically. That's not to yes. underestimate the amount of effort and pain that that process involves. But it's it's also the same with habit, you know? So let's talk slightly let's segue into what are some of the treatments for addiction what are some of the things that we can do what are some of the areas we can invest our puny little bits of willpower into that will have an amplifying effect that will get us over the line i suppose so i want to return to one of the myths that you cannot treat an addiction with a drug can you drive out an addiction with another drug uh the answer it turns out is yeah sometimes sometimes you can So one of my favorite examples of this is a drug called Anabuse. Anabuse, which those who are in the uh, alcohol addiction world know all about. It is a drug that literally when you are prescribed it, your prescriber will tell you, don't drink with this drug in your system because it can kill you. (laughs) It will, it will at the very least, and now that, that, by the way, that it, it probably will not kill you, but it could if you, if you binge at a very, very high level. Probably what it will do is make you violently sick and wish you were dead for a little while. And so, it, you know, we've, we talked uh, recently in an episode about like the Odysseus having himself tied to the mast, mm. right? Before he gets too close to the siren song, he knows that he's going to have no willpower. And abuse is kind of like tying yourself to the mast in advance. It's like, okay, well, um, so that's the, gonna... wait, the purpose of the drug is to make you have such a like violent reaction to alcohol. That's it. That's yeah. what it does. That's all it does. Whoa. That's it. It, it doesn't, it doesn't uh, reduce craving. Dude, that's uh, crazy. Yeah. Uh, and not surprisingly, it's not a very popular drug. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it uh, I mean, because that it is definitely yeah. one way to tie yourself to the mast. My goodness. Yeah, but, you know, for the occasional, I mean, you know, everybody's motivational system, everybody's brain, everybody's mind is a little different. And for some people, that's all it takes. It's like, okay, well, I don't want to kill myself. So I guess 
I've already used my willpower to get the end abuse in my system. So like now I don't have any choice. I'm tied to the mast. And, and some people, now some people tragically will go ahead and get drunk anyway. Sure. They'll just be like, screw it. I'm, you know, I, I'm powerless to not drink. So yeah, I'm going to be violently ill, but, but that's, that's a problem for future me to deal with. Yeah. <laughs> me right now, I'm getting drunk. Mm -hmm. Uh, okay. So let's talk about a better, uh, option pharmacologically. This is a drug called Suboxone, which probably some folks have heard about. And it's a combination drug, by the way. Um, this is a drug primarily useful for people who are addicted to opiates, right? So that could be heroin. It could be Vicodin. It could be Oxy. It could be fentanyl or carfentanyl and any of the synthetic opiates that are ruining so many lives. Now, Suboxone has a replacement opiate called buprenorphine and it it is a basically a less addictive less disabling less lethal opiate so people generally do not kill themselves ODing on buprenorphine and they're particularly unlikely to do so if they take it in the form of this combo drug suboxone why because it has a second drug along with it it's called naltrexone which might uh, remind some listeners of the rescue drug called naloxone uh, or Narcan, which I hope everybody knows about because uh, Narcan is available, at, at least in the U.S., I assume this is true throughout the U.K. and Europe, it, it's available at any pharmacy, any drugstore, no questions asked, because it is a rescue drug. If you get it to somebody, and you can you do it as an inhaler, even if they're unconscious, somebody who's ingested a potentially lethal overdose of opiate, it binds so strongly to their opiate receptors that it'll be like, hey, heroin, get the hell off this receptor. I'm here now. And if given in time, it can literally rescue someone from dying of uh, basically suffocating from an uh, opiate overdose. Can I tell you something cool? Yeah. I talked to someone literally yesterday who is a researcher here locally, and she is working as part of a pretty big research team on a piece of wearable tech. So it's a wearable bracelet. Oh, man. I that love it. Will tell people or signify to people when they are ODing on opiates so that the people around them can administer that drug that you were talking about. That That is amazing. Yeah. So, I, I, another I, question I had was I, a lot of our guys in Harlem, they used to be on methadone. Yep. Yeah. It's the same idea as okay. buprenorphine, it's just not as. Um, uh, not as desirable, I would say, from a, a neuroscience standpoint. Methadone is a little more uh, dysregulating. It's a little more addictive. I, I mean, bup buprenorphine, again, it's, it's buprenorphine and methadone are both addictive opiates. So we're treating an addiction to something like heroin or fentanyl or, you know, something that will kill you if you accidentally take just a little bit too much. And now we're replacing it with something that will allow you to function and actually mm. hold down a job and get off the street if you're on the street, you know, assuming everything else is in place in your life and function socially and not completely destroy your health. So it's a pretty good trade. Yeah, obviously, so it's, it's kind of like a lesser of two evils then. Is that what you're saying? Like it gives people more time or bandwidth or more of a chance to get out of the vortex. It moves them out of the complete center of the eye of the storm of heroin yes. and slightly yes. more on the edges so they can swim to safety or they've got a better chance at least. They ha at least have a fighting chance and they'll okay. live to see another day and to have another fight. And what I was going to say about Suboxone, one of the reasons I like that drug is not only does it have the safer opiate, the buprenorphine, but it also has naltrexone, which is chemically similar to that rescue drug, naloxone. But... Um, instead of like just completely kicking all the opiates off the receptors, it just kind of sort of blocks some of them. So it basically makes it so you can't get a lot of reward from even the opiates that you're using. And it makes it less likely that the person would have an overdose experience. So it's a kind of clever little hack. 
right? And naltrexone, by the way, can be used on its own. It doesn't have to be used with an opiate. There are lots and lots of people that just take naltrexone while they're in recovery, they've stopped using and they find that naltrexone can limit and reduce craving because as we're going to talk about in just a little bit, craving for an addict in recovery, craving is a big part of the ball game, deciding who's going to stay clean and who's going to slip back into addiction. So talk to me then about, and I want to be careful not to bring my own bias here. Are there downsides to this? Because I know we've talked a lot about drugs in the context of, say, something like depression and anxiety and such and such and so on. But what about in the addiction world? Like, what are some of the uh, the drawbacks to fighting Absolutely. fire with fire or using the dark arts against the dark arts, as I think you said? Yeah, you know, and here's a, a, a general principle of psychopharmacology. There, I don't even know if they say this in Ireland. There is no free lunch. You can't just get a drug that's all upside and no downside. Every drug that is powerfully effective has at least some potential to do something undesirable, right? So like even life-saving vaccines, very often, you know, so, or it may not even be a life-saving vaccine. There's a, there's a disease called shingles that probably people have heard about. That's like chicken pox for old people or middle-aged people. And I got to get the vaccine because I'm an old person now, or at least middle age. And, you know, a lot of people get the vaccine and they feel kind of crappy for a few days. You know, they feel like they got a mild flu or something. Right. But way, way, way better than getting shingles and having debilitating pain that never goes away. Like, mm. you know, I'll take that trade off. These drugs to treat addiction absolutely have potential downsides. Buprenorphine, methadone, these are opiates. They, they do opiate things. They, they dull the senses. We don't ever want somebody who's not currently addicted to start taking one of these opiates, yeah. right? Now, naltrexone, yeah, it can reduce craving, but it can also, for some people, make them, depending on the dose, can make them less likely to enjoy everyday pleasure. It can make them less likely to get high on life. So... Again, no, no free lunch. Every useful drug has a potential downside. The good news is that for some people, the benefit vastly outweighs the downside. And for other people, it's like, nope, downside is a deal breaker. Not even worth going there. Yeah. I think something that I find really helpful in this conversation is there's this metaphor that gets thrown around in the recovery community where they talk about there are lots of different paths up the mountain, but there are no shortcuts. The way I understand it anyway is it's it's unpacking the reality that people get sober in a whole bunch of different ways, but it's all hard. You know, it Absolutely. always costs something. It always is a journey. There's always ups and downs involved. Usually relapse is a part of that journey as well. And I think, you know, there is this obsession in our culture to try to find like the magic pill that will solve everything. But even if you're on these drugs, you still have to walk up the mountain, you know? Exactly. You still have to do the work. It's it's like, um, you know, and we're going to do an episode at some point on the use of psychedelics in psychotherapy, in healing from various forms of, of suffering and pain. And one of the most promising uses is for people that have post-traumatic stress disorder. They're haunted by some really horrible memory in the past. Well, what does the psychedelic do? It just allows them to do the work of healing, of facing, mm. of processing, of you know all the work that's necessary in healing and recovering from trauma. It just makes it easier, right? But they still have to do the work. Yeah. And the drugs that I get the most excited about therapeutically are the ones that just facilitate really good and effective psychotherapy and healing through doing the work. And that's what these anti-addiction pills really can be for some people. They, they, they're not necessary. I would say probably most addicts are not going to use them. Most probably will not need them. 
I would say actually many long-standing opiate addicts really should make it their first stop to talk to their healthcare professional about like, you know, is this worth a try? Because I, I, I just believe that the risk of, of dying from that addiction is so great that it probably is worth thinking about. But, you know, it doesn't matter. Every addict is still going to have to do the hard work. So speaking of hard work. <laughs> yeah. Talk to me about yeah, everybody AA. Wants to talk about that. Talk yeah. to me about 12 steps, man, because I know a lot uh, of guys in that community and they are hardcore. Hardcore. You know, baby. and, you know, I mean, it makes sense. Like, you got to fight fire with fire. Like, the same determination and uh, I'm going to just use the word obsession that goes into being addicted to a substance is also very evident in a lot of these programs. And I'm so glad because they freaking work. They do. And we now have some really incredible. I remember teaching graduate students 20 years ago in a class on addiction and treatment 20 years ago. And I had to say, look, you know, because the question would always come up. Well, what about 12 step programs? How effective is AA? And the answer was we have so little good evidence one way or the other. We have a lot of anecdote, but like the plural of anecdote is not data. Like, honestly, yeah. we don't know. And now I'm so excited because we do know we have mountains of evidence. We have a recent review of 35 pretty high quality, reasonably high quality studies showing that like for people who are willing to stay with it and do the 12 steps, do the AA thing, they are way more likely to stop using alcohol. They're way more likely to get sober and to stay sober. So, um, you know, it's, it's not a, a, a miracle. It's not a panacea. It's not for everyone. But for those who are able to, or, and you know, actually, let's put it this way. For those who are able and willing to acquire the new set of habits that come from working through the 12 steps, you know, to leverage their limited willpower and even to offload some of the willpower to the community. Dude, outsourcing willpower to the community. It's my favorite thing to do. <laughs> <laughs> It's uh, it, it's such an incredible life hack. And, you know, we were talking earlier about the fact that we've got such a finite little teeny tiny thimble full of willpower to expend at any given moment. If we can outsource that to anyone who cares about us, who has a, a framework and a context to basically help us put the right habits into place, it's, it's game changing. It's yeah. game changing. I'm, I mean, the example I always give is just, it's the difference between going out for a run by yourself and meeting your friend at the same time at the same place every single week. Two totally, totally different experiences. One, you got to force yourself to. The other one, you just kind of have to show up and get swept along in the run. Do you know what I mean? Absolutely. Yeah. And, and you know, so much of life is like that, right? And, and I think we said it a couple episodes ago that Aristotle had this figured out like 2,400 years ago where he's like, look, virtue character. It's all about just building the right habits. Mm. Um, we need to get to the place where like all the things that are good for us are basically like on autopilot because we've made them so habitual that we don't have to leverage our little supply of willpower to choose to do the right thing because it's already now a habit. Okay. So, and then kind of on that point then, ah, well, before we do that, there's one thing that I want to do. I don't know how you'll feel about it. So I went through the 12 steps recently. Like I read them. Um, I was doing a series on addiction. I had a couple of people in my life in AA and I read the big book, as they call it. Yeah, yeah. And it was the first time I've actually, like I've heard of the 12 steps. I've never actually discovered what the 12 steps actually are. And as I went through the book, I was like, hold on a second. Like, this is not what I was expecting to be like at all. I thought it would be like step number one, remove alcohol from your house. <laughs> step number two, never go to a pub. Step number three, you know, all this sort of stuff. And yeah. it is a virtuous program. It's a spiritual yeah. program. It's like all the 12 yeah. steps are nothing really to do with drink and everything to do about your character and your spirit and your honesty and forgiveness and like all this kind of more like woo woo stuff. You know, I, I really was expecting like this really ultra um, specific physical thing that you would do. So in light of that, like I just feel like I would be doing a disservice to the listener 
to not ask, what is up with all of these recovered addicts having spiritual experiences, connecting to some sort of a faith, uh, giving themselves over to some sort of higher power? Like, as a man of science that I, I know you are, <laughs> what is your take on that? <laughs> Uh, such a, such a deep question. I, I mean, if you could see my thought bubble right now, <laughs> it's just spinning. There, there are like five different things I want to say, different, different rabbit holes we could chase down. So let, let me, let me just try to sift through some of the most important. First of all, AA does have a prescriptive set of habits relating to alcohol, right? They're like, you know, the, the goal is not not to drink. <laughs> the goal <laughs> <laughs> the goal is to stay sober and to lean on your sponsor, which is somebody who is further down the the road to recovery than you are, to lean on them for support and inspiration and encouragement and wisdom, to lean on the community and, and to build a set of habits. But so you know, definitely that's there. But what they're also saying is like, look, you on your own are almost certainly powerless to escape this vortex. You're caught in a web and it's destructive and it's got you and you're an addict. You are an addict and we are here for you, but you've got to be honest. First, you've got to honestly face the problem. You're an addict and this thing has taken over your life. You are not strong enough to escape it. So, I mean, just being honest with oneself and with the world about like, I do not have the willpower to make this go away. That's, you know, th this idea of like turning to the higher power. I, and there's a lot that we need to unpack with that, right? The spiritual, the explicitly spiritual component of AA. But the first thing that strikes me as a clinician is just the honesty of saying, I am caught. I can't stop this. I need to turn it over to the higher power and to the community. That's huge. And, you know, it's huge in so many different ways because it's just so wise about the fact that most of us cannot white knuckle our way to recovery through willpower alone. But secondly, it's saying let's outsource that task to the community, but then also this idea of a higher power, like what's going on there? Why is that important? Well, most addicts that I've known, either personally or clinically, most of them have an enormous reservoir of self-loathing, self-blame, guilt. They know that because of their addiction, they have hurt people that they care about. They've let go of responsibilities that they cared about. They've let go of principles. They've done things that they feel ashamed of. And the toll of self-loathing is so enormous that the, offering to people a chance of redemption, a chance of like, look, this is a place where you're not going to be judged. This is a place where you're going to be accepted and understood. Yes, you're going to, going to be challenged to work your ass off, to get sober and to stay sober, to recover and to reconnect, to become a better person, to make amends where you've made a mess of things. But it's just so beautifully wise psychologically. And the fact that it's done 100% by people in the community, not professionals. I think one of the reasons so many professionals are kind of skeptical or maybe even salty, maybe even jealous about AA, it must be a cult. It must be, you know, oh, they're just doing this woo-woo spirituality thing. It's like, well, look, man, I don't care what they're doing. If they're getting results and saving people's lives and healing people's lives, then I'm all for it. Absolutely. Absolutely. Can I give just like a few practical things I've picked up from AA? Absolutely. Yeah. And then we should circle back around and, and talk because there's, there's more to unpack there. Awesome. So the first two, I guess, are just mantras. AA is full of mantras. And like anybody who goes to AA, they're just like a walk and quote machine. They are so, so, so good at like all these class one-liners. A few of them that have stood out to me is they have this idea where it's like, you can use, you just have to call somebody first. 
So it's like <laughs> it's like one of the unofficial rules. Yeah. It's like, yeah. that's, dude, don't worry about it. Like, totally, you can take a drink. You just have to talk to your sponsor first, and then you can go and you yeah. can use. And it kind yeah. of in a similar vein, it's this idea. It's like, yeah, yeah, you can totally use, but you have to do it tomorrow. You know, yeah. and it's like it's like the infinite loop of that. Like, if you just did that every single day, and my favorite thing about AA is they are obsessed with the measurement of time of a day you know it's a day yeah. at a time and yeah to condense your your huge problem into that 24 hour window is you don't have to worry about the next 40 years you just have to focus on the 24 hours that are in front of you and that gets boiled down into the hour that's in front of you and that gets boiled down into the minute that you're in this very minute and i just find that to be highly practical and extremely useful uh, not just for addiction, but for a whole bunch of other things. The third thing, and the last thing I'll say at this point is, you ever heard of HALT? H-A-L-T? No. Oh, dude, you're going to love this. So HALT is like a little an acronym, a little framework that a lot of people in AA will walk themselves through when they have the desire to use. And dude, you can use this in your life for a whole bunch of stuff. So the scenario is, Let's say I've had a really bad day at work or I've had a huge fight with my wife and I feel that creeping sensation to use my drug of choice. Okay, I'm going to take literally 30 seconds and I'm going to run through halt. So the first one is hunger. Am I hungry? The second one is angry. Am I angry? Am I lonely? Or am I tired? And what a lot of anecdotal kind of evidence within these communities has brought up is that these are the four things that just are really easy to solve or at least are easy to identify that can make a big impact on whether or not you actually end up using. So if you're hungry, go ahead and eat. If you're angry, okay, why am I angry? Is there something I need to address here? Is there a piece of forgiveness I either need to seek out or give? Am I lonely? Okay, isolation is a huge part of addiction. How do I get some connection into my life here? And then tired is it just a case where I'm overworked here, my stress level's too high, I need to take a nap or I need to look into taking some time off so I can bring myself back into that place of equilibrium. So there you go, halt. Next time you, you feel the urge, <laughs> just halt and walk yourself through the four. Yeah, that, that's great. It's just so uh, practical, pithy, wise. Um, you know, there's a, there's a lot potentially to unpack there, but so I, talk to I, me about God then. <laughs> yeah, let's talk about, <laughs> tell me. Hey, wasn't there a pop song? Tell me all your thoughts on God because I'd really like to meet her. I mean, you know that song? It's it, called uh, is it, Counting Blue Cars, I think. Okay, I was like, what generation are we? Because I don't know it, this but is, I also don't know 90s. a lot of modern music. T- tell me all your thoughts Ooh, on God. Doctor can sing. Go ahead, bro. Because I really like to meet her. You don't know that song? <laughs> I don't, bro, but I also was oh. not existing when it came out, I think. Yeah, I think the band was literally called Counting Blue Cars or something. Or maybe nice. that was the song. I don't know. Anyway, hey, listen, you, you Gen Xers out there, you know exactly <laughs> what I'm talking about. All right, where were we? I'm going to tell you all my thoughts on God, at least as, as <laughs> actually, I'm not going to do that at all. But I, I am going to address it in the, in the context of addiction and 12 step. I, so, all right, first things first. It has been suggested by people who have taken a very, very deep dive on this question that the human species may have a faith instinct, that we may be more or less hardwired to have spiritual experiences. And they probably serve a couple of different functions for us. First and foremost, they uh, help enhance our connection with other people of shared belief, right? It's like a, an image that, that has been helpful for me is like, you know, people that are dancing around a maypole, you know, they're all holding onto a <laughs> ribbon and the maypoles. And it's like they're, we can dance together with people of shared belief or shared spirituality that forms a kind of a, a central hub for connection. Secondly, many of us have the capability of having transcendent spiritual experiences 
that, you know, sometimes are described as psychedelic experiences, uh, consciousness altering experiences. They can happen in meditation. They can happen in prayer. They can happen in religious ceremonies, lots of different ways to get there. But those of us who've had these experiences know that they're incredibly powerful, or at least they can be, and can be, for some, very good at lighting up the brain's reward circuitry. In other words, they can be like getting high on life at a very high level. So if somebody is coming out of addiction, and I mean, we see it so often that a person basically trades their addiction to their drug of choice, to an addiction to God, to an addiction to spirituality. And I, I should put that word addiction in, in scare quotes there, right? Because it's, it's a, I would say, in most cases, a benevolent or benign type of obsession. Or well, it's, it's kind of back to your, your point that you said earlier about like the AA is perceived to be a cult. Yes. And in some ways, yes, that's because it is. And a lot of people yes. in AA will just straight up tell you, yes, but it works. And, you know, so I, I actually am totally, I buy into that. Like I'm, I'm comfortable with it, even though it kind of sounds on the surface level, a little bit controversial, but I, I think it makes sense. Yeah, no, absolutely. And, and I, I say that really with, with no judgment, although I do think as a, you know, as a psychologist, as a clinician, it occurs to me that we might want to bracket it with a little bit of caution that, I mean, we probably, most of us have known someone who kind of went a bit off the deep end. Maybe they joined a literal cult or maybe they um, took such a deep dive into altered states of consciousness, maybe with the use of psychedelics, maybe through meditation, maybe some, you know, other spiritual practice where it kind of took over their life in a way that we might see as somewhat unbalanced. Dude, now, negative long-term consequences keep coming back to that. There, there you go. Yeah, exactly right. So let's just say maybe we can stipulate there is a healthy form of spiritual addiction and a potentially toxic form for a small subset of people probably. Okay. So, you know, I, I, I feel like the spiritual component of AA allows the addict to encounter something that is in very short supply, two things in very short supply in the modern world. One, forgiveness. Mm. And not cheap forgiveness. Forgiveness tied to restitution, tied to redemption. You're going to earn the forgiveness in a sense. Nobody can earn it, but you're going to honor the forgiveness with changing your life. Yeah. And you're going to honor it with going back. And one of the 12 steps, as you know, is making amends, like literally contacting every person that the addict has harmed or let down and apologizing. And just offering a sincere apology is something that doesn't happen nearly often enough, I think, in, in today's culture. Yeah, absolutely. But it's very psychologically healing. And, and particularly for the addict, remember... Most addicts wind up at a point where they're, they're really ashamed and they're, they feel guilty. There's often a lot of self-loathing. And that's part of the beauty of the AA, the 12-step model for those. Remember, no one-size-fits-all approach. Some people can't stand it. It's horrible for some people. But for many, it, it offers a path to redemption and recovery that nothing else will. And actually, a lot of the things that we've touched on in other episodes, like things like diet, things like exercise, things like sleep, things like some of the supplements, particularly like omega-3 and vitamin D, particularly if you're from that kind of Irish context where the sun doesn't shine all the time. What we've kind of been loosely packaging together so far is this idea of like a mental health toolkit. I just would love to know, like those basic mental health foundational principles, I'm assuming are going to be really, really valuable and also walk in a journey of recovery. Absolutely. Yeah. And I mean, we could add to it the importance of having a, a structure in place for connection, right? And I think really, to me, as a mental health professional, one of the beauties of the 12-step model, but they've learned just through their battles in the trenches, that if you want to recover from addiction, 
your, your odds are dramatically better if, you, if you've got a system in place of staying connected to other people who are kindred spirits, who are walking that same walk, you know, they, they meet on a really regular basis. And, and I know a lot of meetings and, uh, you know, they're daily. They, they, and then, then they'll have a sponsor, somebody that they can check in with on a regular basis and, and just go over their progress and go over their, their temptation, go over like, you know, hey, what what kind of cravings are, are you having? What, how are you dealing with that? You know, are you taking it one day at a time? Because mm. our goal is only to get through today. You know, so there's there there are programs even within the program. Um, <laughs> and 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 the beauty of it is. Like, like you just said, I mean, outsourcing our willpower, realizing that we may only have enough actual willpower to resist temptation for the next five minutes, but we can do it and then add five minutes and then add an hour, add two hours if we also have a, a deeper sort of structure in place that allows us to be connected with other people that can basically supplement our own little puny reserves of willpower for us. And like I would say, like the only things that started to make a big difference in my recovery journey was whenever I started to kind of share the load with other people. Like, I think you can do all these things, or in my experience, I was doing all these things kind of in isolation, but it was only whenever I then like opened myself up and brought other people in on that journey and invited them to be a part of it and also joined with them on their journey, if that makes sense. Like you create yeah. the fellowship as it were. And all of a sudden, like... There is this momentum that comes with community. There is this amazing, powerful thing that happens in your brain whenever you're sharing with other people, whenever you're being open, whenever you're being honest. We talked a lot in a previous episode uh, as part of our pandemic series around episode three, episode four. The title is Connection and Belonging in the Age of Social Distancing. And we talk a lot about what's happening in our brains whenever we're spending time with other people, whenever we are connected, whenever we have that sense of belonging. And there's some really, really practical tools for you to go and explore in terms of community building in your own life and building relationships and having systems in place to, that can kind of support some of these tools of recovery as well. I do want to touch on honesty slightly and honestly evaluating where we are instead of distracting ourselves from the reality of our lives is definitely mm-hmm. something that I've been guilty of at my worst moments with addiction, where it's always trying to run away from reality or it's always trying to escape the pain. And I've just found that it's only through embracing that pain and not running away from it is actually the only time I can start to make any sort of progress. And that's mm-hmm. tough. Like, obviously to stare down the dragon as it were is not an easy thing to do and i think that maybe after listening to an episode like this you can at least have some sort of a framework or some sort of a language to even name the monster that you may be facing there's a thing i love i don't know where i heard it or who i'm stealing this from but they they give the example of how like in horror movies particularly older horror movies that can be so scary and so incredible like and you really feel the tension you really feel the drama and then you see the monster and all of a sudden, it's like, womp, womp, womp. Like, it's like a movie from, like, the 70s, and the monster looks so crab and, like, so terrible. And you're like, why would anyone be be afraid of this? But it was the that unknown sort of aspect to it that was so terrifying. And I think with a lot of these mental disorders that we're covering in this series, like, once you have a name for the monster, I think it's very, very, very powerful and takes a lot of the a lot of the strength that kind of those dragons can have. So, you know, maybe you've been facing a behavior or you've been facing a habit for a while and you're like, you know, is this a problem in my life? I'm not sure. Maybe after this, you can walk away with a bit of clarity and actually say, okay, I now know what I'm dealing with. And now that I know what I'm dealing with, I know that I need to go off and get some tools. I know I need to get some people alongside me. I know there's specific weapons that I can use that we've signposted today, whether it's some of the drugs we mentioned, whether it's a 12-step program, whether it's building out that mental health toolkit of diets, exercise, sleep, or some of these other things we've talked about in previous episodes. You know, the dopamine fast could be interesting for you to look into, depending on the severity of your uh, addiction as well. Can I can I jump in? Just... Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah, and just to build on the point about honesty, one of the things we find, not just with addiction, but um, certainly for folks that have that have struggled with 
something taking over their life, whether it's addiction or an eating disorder or some other compulsive behavior, is there's a lot of denial. There's a lot of denial. And, you know, we get really good at deceiving ourselves <laughs> about unpleasant truths, about things that, you know, most people who have an addiction, whether it's a drug addiction or a behavioral addiction, they, they're in some denial about how important that thing is to them. They're, they're just denial about whether or not they can, you know, you'll hear people say, oh yeah, you know, it's not that big a deal. I can quit anytime. Look, I quit that, you know, for two, I quit for two whole weeks, that one stretch. Like yeah. that proves that I have no addiction. Um, and so being able to step outside of, of that web of denial and just take a good, honest look, just to get to a point of just baseline vulnerability. This is, this is who I am. This is where I am. This is what my struggle is that it takes a lot of courage. It's not comfortable, but it, it's such an important step. And, and so I, yeah, I, I, I really resonate with that a lot because I would say virtually every person that I've worked with who battled addiction got to be a very skilled liar. Mm. A lot of the lies were understandable. They were, you know, to basically get other people off my case, get other people off my back. I don't need people up in my business. So there was a lot of that kind of lying. But a lot of lying to self, which I think at the, at the end of the day is even the most destructive kind of lie. Yeah. And again, you know, part of that community aspect is to help with the blind spots in your life, you know? Yep. And uh, that's the power of friendship as well, isn't it? Ab absolutely. Yeah. And so, you know, if I can maybe try to bring this around full circle, we were talking just a minute ago about the the finite willpower that we have and having a system and it, you know, which is in a way kind of a fancy way of talking about having healthy habits, right? Because I mean, we all know that once we've made something a habit, now it doesn't really require any willpower to continue the habit, right? So like, you know, the, the example I like to use for this is, is if you're flossing your teeth, right? You go to the, the dentist, the dental hygienist, it's like, Oh, you, you need to be flossing. Uh, let me show you how. And, probably most people have that experience of starting with it. They get back home, they're in front of the mirror, they got the floss. And it's like, ah, eh, this is kind of a hassle. It takes a lot of willpower. But then for those of us who've been lucky, lucky enough to have actually gone through and made it a habit, <laughs> now it's, it's, it's automatic. It's like, it's effortless. It takes no willpower at all. It's like, in fact, there are circuits in the brain that when we pick up the floss, our dopamine-based reward circuits actually give a little signal of like, yeah, this is, we're doing the thing that we do. We're doing the habit. Zero willpower required. Now, I'm going to try to square the circle. The, the ball game for mental health in many, many respects is to make healthy habits so effortless that they now require no willpower at all. Um, we have just put in place this set of practices and principles that are really, really beneficial, but that don't take any willpower. Well, one of those habits can be telling the truth, honesty with other people. Why? Because that's what's going to help us have the deepest connections, the most meaningful connections when we're just baseline, completely transparent. And then honesty with ourselves, which is going to allow us to really be clear about areas that we we really can target for um, for improving and and for healing. And I love this because it it really ties into a lot of your life's work, which has been kind of pointing the finger back to hunter gatherer communities and being like a lot of stuff that they just naturally did is good for us and we don't naturally do it anymore and we have to find ways to kind of artificially bring it back into our lives. I'm reading a exactly. book about exercise at the minute and he talks a lot about the hunter-gatherer kind of lifestyle and he's like, you know, how hilarious is it that we pay money to go to a place to like lift up heavy things for an hour a few times a week? <laughs> you know, he's like, yeah. if you show that to any like hunter-gatherer individual that'd be like what the hell are you doing wasting your calories on work that leads to no food or no fruition you know what i mean but like Absolutely. this idea of honesty you know like back in the day when we all lived in incredibly close-knit uh quarters with our friends and our family and our community there was also just like way less opportunities to lie and hide stuff so yeah it's interesting like 
coming back and having to maybe artificially put some of those accountability measures in place depending on what your drug of choice is there's obviously a lot of really interesting stuff you can do with gambling where there is this there are the systems in place to ban yourself from kind of in person i don't know what do you guys call them in the states we call them bookies uh, yeah <laughs> yeah no absolutely and I, I i do want to just put out one thing as a clinician here which is there's a reason why addicts are so prone to hiding and lying and and that is that they've often experienced to be honest is to be judged right mm. and to be honest with themselves is often to be caught in a in a, a vortex of self-judgment and self loathing and self-hatred but um you know th- the greatest gift that we can give to someone who's battling with addiction is just to be fully present to them without judgment to to give them that that very strong signal like look i get it you know you're you're in a really you're in a really dark place right now and you're really caught in this thing and you're doing things that that you judge and that you hate but i'm here for you and I'm going to let you have the gift of being honest without judgment right now. And, th- you know, that can be incredibly transformative mm-hmm. for someone. So, uh, you know, it's, I, I just wanted to put out there, like, it's, it's not like, uh, oh, addicts are terrible people because they're not honest. There's a reason why they've learned often um, that honesty is a dangerous thing. We need, to, we need to be able to provide a setting for them where they can be honest with, without being judged. I really like how you've kind of brought it back to people who are maybe dealing with a loved one that has an addiction. Mm -hmm. Yep. And I think something we can learn from, you know, recovery groups is just this idea of, and it kind of gets memed a little bit, but, you know, it's like, thanks for sharing. You know, <laughs> you know, like there's no, there's no advice. There's no, okay, here's what you do. Like you do this, you do that, you do that. Or, or what are you doing? You're so stupid. Like it's easy. Just one, two, three, bada bing, bada boom. Your addiction's gone. Like, I just don't get it. And like when someone finally shares with you that they realize they have a problem or they come to you with the tail in between their legs, confessing that they have relapsed. Really that moment is is a moment to say thank you for sharing full stop you know it's uh absolutely let's create a space where this person can share and maybe that's all it is all it is is listening for this kind of first day or first week or whatever kind of the time frame is in your specific scenario and then as time goes on if the person is asking for it if the person is open to it then you can start to bring in some other things. But the first point of call should be, I think, listening and accepting, no matter how painful that might be in the moment. So, you know, there's a lot of talk Mm. about mindfulness. There's a lot of talk about meditation. I think a lot of people have a very specific idea in their head of what that is, and it's nowhere near as mystical or as difficult to embark on a practice like that. But even something simple like going for a walk without your headphones or... Mm -hmm. you know sitting on your sofa at the end of the day or in your desk and even just like sitting there for five minutes and just listening to what's happening inside you like listening to yourself not with that judgment that we were talking about but just with that openness and that acceptance I think can be very very powerful and it seems so simple and I know people are getting to the end of you know, this long episode here. And they're like, really, is that what you're going to spend this time talking about? But (laughs) I know for me, it has been surprisingly powerful as a way of really connecting with the pain and connecting with what's going on. And I think when you sit with those emotions, whether it is the desire to use and you're calm in that moment and you get somewhat comfy in the uncomfortable feeling something strange does start to happen where it loses its power somewhat those emotions and those kind of thoughts that pop up in the moment that make us want to use and make us kind of run away from our pain and escape reality it's interesting how if you even just give it a couple of minutes you know we think as addicts that if we 
were not to run away, those things would destroy us. But very often they lose their power the longer that we kind of sit with them. And it also is just a really helpful way to assess and see like what's actually going on or I see some of the roots behind some of these issues that can then be kind of worked out with a professional or with your community or with your 12-step program or whatever it is. But again, it's it, I think it starts with awareness of what is the pain that you're actually running away from. Yeah, that's really beautiful. You're reminding me of a friend of mine who is, yeah, this is a shameless name drop, by the way, um, Dr. Kelly Wilson, who is the co-creator of a uh, really popular form of psychotherapy called ACT, or Acceptance and Commitment Therapy. Damn, boy, do you know her? Very cool. Uh, it, actually, Kelly's a he, but... Uh, <laughs> Damn, boy, but... <laughs> do you know him? <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I do, in, in fact, know Kelly. And um, Kelly's very honest and transparent about the fact that he is a recovered drug addict. And so, you know, I think it's part of his journey of just seeing that just exactly what you were saying. We have so much, I'm going to use a fancy term, but I think everybody's going to connect with it quickly. Experiential avoidance. In other words, there there are these uncomfortable feelings that we can have when we're alone with our thoughts, when we're alone with our feelings and we don't have headphones and we don't have any electronic distraction. We're just there with our own minds. And Kelly's big insight is if we can just, just be at peace long enough to sit with it and let it wash over us and just accept this is what I'm feeling in this moment, this really remarkable thing happens where we begin to habituate, right? It's exposure to that which we've been avoiding. And we talked about this, um, Uh, earlier, we're going to talk about it again in Anxiety 101, which is exposure to anything uncomfortable leads to habituation. The brain gets used to it. We drop our level of discomfort and it happens automatically. We don't even have to try. It just happens anytime we face that thing that we've been avoiding. Um, And so anyway, yeah, there's just some really, really deep wisdom, I think, Hugh, and what, what you're talking about with allowing ourselves to be present with our own minds in a way that the modern world increasingly lures us away from. Man, that was very, very nicely put. I enjoyed that. Thank you. I'm going to, I'm looking for a hot take here. Are, do you have a hot take in you at the end of this? Do you have one left up your sleeve? One, one last hot take. So we, one of our themes with every disorder, every mental illness or, or form of psychological suffering that we talk about, we're, we're looking for a superpower, right? What, what, what is the, the people who we talked about with ADHD, there's a superpower of hyper-focus. What's the superpower of addiction? And I, I think maybe there, there could be two, but the one I'm going to focus on right now, I've already hinted at, which is just an extraordinary level of, Um, capacity for compassion. Mm. Those who have been to the abyss, remember the addictive drug, the addictive behavior, it has taken over the brain's motivational circuitry. It's hacked into the brain and said, this is your reason for living. This is it. Using this heroin, um, you know, feeding this gambling habit, whatever the thing is, when a person has has had their brain hacked in that way and they've been right on the edge, it's like a type of death because they, they end up losing so much of what they really care about. And if they can come back from that abyss, if they can get clean, if they can find their way to, you know, and I think most recovered addicts talk about being in recovery, not mm-hmm. like, oh, I'm better forever. This is something, this is a, a discipline every day. I'm in, reco- I'm a recovering addict, not like I'm fully healed forever. But there's a, a level of humility, a level of compassion, a level of empathy that I, I think is really quite extraordinary. There's a level of humanity that, um, I don't know, some, some of the best people that I've ever known are recovered addicts. And I don't think that that's an accident. Yeah. It's really interesting, like, 
Lamke has a, a quote at the start of her book that says something along the lines of, you know, recovered addicts are the modern day prophets Mm -hmm. of our world whose lessons like we just cannot afford to ignore and that the wisdom from recovery and from recovery communities are quickly becoming kind of like part and parcel of the everyday operating system that like we as modern individuals are going to have to have in our tool belt I know we talk a lot about tool belts in this show but it's just the reality you know and a lot of the tools that like kind of were somewhat exclusively used by the recovery community over the last 100 years are going to they're going to be things that we need to teach our kids just to kind of move their way through this digital dystopia that we find ourselves a part of because the technology is just too good you know the apps are too powerful the the dopamine triggers uh whether they are digital or physical are just they're too strong for the average mind to handle and so it's interesting like people who even from I don't know, I'm going to steal some of your language, so you're going to need to fact check me here. Like People who you know don't have the, the sensitivities in their dopamine system that maybe you know the, the stereotypical addict would have, like these people who have the robust neurochemistry who would have been fine like 50 years ago, a lot of them are also getting themselves kind of caught up in some of the more modern behavioral addictions just because the drug is so powerful, so to speak. So... Yeah, no, that's that's a great point, and and it it also highlights um, so the and I mentioned this earlier, but I think it's it bears repeating the the two most dangerous classes of psychoactive drugs right now are the opiates and the benzodiazepines, mm. and both so the opiates of course are literally killing hundreds of thousands of people across the globe. Wild. Many of the people that they're killing were prescribed the opiate at, by their doctor as a painkiller. So it's something, you know, that, that, that was, that had a potential benefit, but inadvertently, so here's the crazy thing. If you're prescribed an opiate, if you're prescribed a benzo like Xanax, which by the way, those are the number one best selling class of psychiatric medications. If you have a brain that is not prone to addiction and you take that drug every day, it can create an addictive brain. It can actually mess with your dopamine receptors and put them in the state of somebody who maybe was genetically born with a a huge vulnerability to addiction. So we were actually creating addictive prone brains, not only with our digital landscape, but also even just with the medications that we prescribe so cavalierly without a a really healthy respect and recognition for the fact that these drugs are changing the brain in a way that makes it an addiction prone brain. So crazy. Yeah, absolutely. I think so. So I think when it comes to superpower, like I'm thinking like, what's, what do I think about that? I think for me, I think the superpower is, in some ways, the discovery and the reliance on the tools. Mm. You know, like, talk about, like, an unbelievable forcing function of if I don't kind of do these healthy practices in my life, I'm at risk of slipping back into patterns of behavior and into addictions that, you know, for years of my pretty young life destroyed my life. And so, you know, the... I I give like my wife as a great example. She's one of those people that has very, again, help me with the language here, strong D2 receptors or something to do with dopamine, right? Yeah, yeah, no, that's it. But yeah, high levels of D2. Yeah, she she must have crazy high levels of D2 receptors. She's the most, she's the least addict prone individual I know. And uh, it's interesting because that's obviously, that's a wonderful thing. And she won the genetic lottery, but. There's also habits in my life that like I have to do that are good for me that she's got no real incentive to do. Yeah. If that Uh makes sense. Uh Yeah, absolutely. And so there's just no shortcut up the mountain. And I've looked for lots of different kinds of shortcuts to recovery. And, you know, like again, like it's a bit of a meme, but like the long, hard, stupid way is typically the fastest way in my experience. It's, uh, there's no easy way. You got it. You kind of have to take the hard <laughs> path up the mountain. There's no gondola. Yeah. You know, I don't know what you guys right, call yeah. it. Like the ski, no, they, yeah, we, the yeah, ski lift. Yeah. But yeah. you kind of have to just 
walk up the side of the cliff and you fall down and you get up again, you fall down and then it's like, you know, three steps forward, two steps back, that sort of thing. Um, but like 10 years into that journey, I'm really glad that I had to make that climb because it's defined me and it's made me who I am today. And just to echo like what you were saying earlier, like that deep empathy, like the ability to look at somebody like literally on the extreme end, like we were talking about at the start of the episode, like the homeless person in New York lying on the side of the road covered in their own crap. Like you can sit down with them and you can literally be like, do you know what, man? Like I know that I was two or three steps away from being exactly where you are. So like, there's no judgment here. Like let's just figure out how we can get around you and get some support to kind of help you start taking the first steps or whether it's the high flying wall streeter who's like, you know, dealing with suicidal thoughts and is really at the end of themselves, even though they quote unquote have it all. Once you've been to the abyss, as you said, like you can look at that person, you could just be like, I get it because I either was there or I was very close to being there. And I think having that ability and having that gift to share with the people in your life is, is very, very valuable. And uh, I think we need more of that in the world of, the ability to listen without judgment and the ability to accept without necessarily trying to change straight away. So there you go. That's my hot take. Love it. Yeah, I, I have nothing to add to that. Well then, <laughs> ladies and gentlemen, then that may be a first. That <laughs> is the end of this episode. That would be an interesting experiment. Like, should we just do should we just do these episodes and until Steve has nothing left to say? And then it's like and that's a wrap. <laughs> oh my God. We're going to have the first seven hour podcast ah! episode. In this. <laughs> I mean, Malcolm and I will can get away with it. Maybe we can too at points as well. I love it. Awesome. So yeah, look, I just want to give a big, big thank you to you for listening to the two parts of this conversation. It's obviously, you know, I, I feel like we didn't even scratch the surface, but I guess that's, that's the podcaster's dilemma. Hopefully we've signposted lots of interest in places for you to, to dive into and explore. If this is an area that is impacting you or impacting someone that you care about, I will just kind of loop back around and encourage you to check out the interview we did with Anna Lemke. A lot about addiction, a lot about dopamine, a lot about what a dopamine fast is. And you may find some of the tools there kind of interesting and useful too. We have a upcoming Q&A episode. We've got our first few questions rolling in. So really appreciate everyone who has recorded messages and sent them in or sent them via email. Mentalhealth.fm is where you can submit questions. And you... Wait, wait, wait. We've got to say that again. That is... I, I have had friends ask me for our website and I'm like, yeah, it's mentalhealth.fm. They're like, wait, that can't be the whole thing. How the hell did you get mental health? I'm like, I have, that, that, is, that, is, that is Hugh. That Hugh is a, is a, is a magician, but yeah. He's, a, he's health, a domain yeah. wizard. It's, it's, I'll be honest with you, Steve, I, dude, we haven't talked about this. It was very difficult to get that domain. And can I, you imagine like, how hard it is to get a, a domain with anything mental health like it's so crowded my only concern mental is like dot FM if you're is if you're under the age of like i don't know i don't want to like offend any younger listeners but like do 16 year olds know what fm is these days like it do, doesn't matter do pe- oh, ah, it's, it doesn't matter yeah. <laughs> who cares <laughs> No, because they've heard it. It's like it's 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 in it's in the cultural FM water. Of the, it's in the million. Yeah, I know. It's they, they've seen a movie somewhere at some point where okay. FM was mentioned. Yeah, it's like uh, like a, a video, like video cassettes yeah. are no longer a thing, but everyone knows what it is. I guess. I guess exactly. Right? Is that does that work? Dude, look at look at the save icon on your computer, and it's a little three and a half inch rigid floppy disk. That's so and kids true. Have never seen a floppy. They don't even know what the hell, but they know that shape. They it's like it's it's part of their memosphere. You know? huh. <laughs> I mean, that would be a really interesting non mental health related episode to do. Is all about like why do we use these <laughs> old artifacts or like a trash can? Why is there a trash can on your computer screen? Anyway, mentalhealth.fm <laughs> is where you can get the show notes for today. We'll also link some papers. We'll link some books uh, as an interesting jump on off point to do a deeper dive into some of those things. We no doubt we'll talk about addiction many, many times on the podcast in the episodes to come. We would love to do more interviews in this space. I have a list of about 12 people in the addiction space alone. I'd love to talk to I would also love to just kind of circle back to the fact that this is a crowdfunded show. 
We are very new in our podcasting journey and we are having a great time, but we rely on the generosity of listeners like you. And it is people just like you who partner with us on our mission to providing this free educational content around the theme of mental health. Steve brings all of the professor to professorial i did this in a, in a previous episode <laughs> ah what is it professor uh, you know I, I i you know what i'm willing to go with professorial but uh, in the business we we we, we generally say pro- professorial. professorial professorial he brings yeah. the professorial research the content he, this is what he lives and breathes this guy is a mental health wizard uh and we're really chuffed that we're able to provide it for free on a platform like this, a platform like Spotify, wherever you get your podcasts. For people all over the world, we're not selling our souls right now. We're not compromising our content to the gods of advertising or sponsorship. We literally rely on small amounts of money. You know, the price of like a hipster cup of coffee. I don't know what that sets you back in America, but it's, you know, around five bucks over here. And uh, we would really appreciate you supporting us in this way. It would give you access to our private community over at patreon.com forward slash mental health podcast it's also going to be linked in the show notes and in the episode description wherever you're listening and you also will get kind of full versions of these two-part episodes as soon as they drop so if you don't like that weight you know you you get to the end of a a conversation you're like i just would like to finish this on this walk uh if you're part of our patreon you can there is no break you can kind of just keep going and listen to the full thing so yeah, that's it. That's all the kind of business admin I have to say. Steve, anything from you? I've got nothing. Yes! <laughs> we did it! Come on, the lads. Awesome. So yeah, thanks again for spending this time with us. Check out our ADHD 101 episodes if you haven't done so already. And really look forward to catching you guys again next time. Steve, thank you very much uh, for your time as you- always appreciate you Hugh, it's it's been yeah likewise right back at you it's 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 been a blast uh and to, to all of you out there uh, listening it's 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 an honor to, to be with you every week so uh till next time we'll see you then <laughs>